I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. This program is brought to you by Juul, sous vide by Chef Steps. Juul takes the guesswork out of cooking. Learn more at chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E. I'm one of HRN's interns, Nina Medvinskaya, with a preview of the next episode of Meat and Three, our weekly food news roundup. This week's topic, the marriage of food and danger. Sometimes, danger lurks in the food that we eat. So instead of saying what is poisonous, I'd rather say what's not, because it's literally just the flesh and the fins. Food poisoning doesn't just threaten our bodies, but it endangers our environment as well. The emissions of JBS, combined with the other top five meat companies, exceed the annual emissions of Exxon, Shell, or BP. For more, tune into this week's Meat and 3 on Heritage Radio Network. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. Before we get into the show, just a quick note on HRN's end of the year fund drive. 2019 is our 10th year, if you can believe it, and we want to make it our most impactful and delicious year yet. So if you could, head over to heritageradionetwork.org forward slash donate and donate today. Today, my guest on the show is Chef Marcus Jacobs. He's the co-owner of Margie's Grill in New Orleans. He grew up in Ohio, and he worked under Chef Alana Schock of Alana's Food and Wine in Columbus. He then moved to California, and then after that, he traveled through southern Japan, and then he ended up in New Orleans, and he also did some traveling in Southeast Asia, so we're going to cover a lot of areas around the world where he's gone. In New Orleans, he worked under Chef Donald Link, Ryan Pruitt, and Rebecca Woolcomb at Herb Saint before opening Margie's Grill with his partner in 2017. The New York Times wrote about the food at Margie's Grill, the palatable balance of sweet, salty, spicy, and acidic flavors typical of Southeast Asian cuisine pairs fabulously with Gulf ingredients, many of which are smoked, grilled, or coal roasted over a barbecue pit out back. Margie's Grill was named one of America's best new restaurants in 2017 by Bon Appetit, one of the five best new restaurants of 2017 by NOLA.com. Food and Wine put it at the top of its roundup of where to eat in New Orleans, and the New Orleans Advocate gave it a glowing review. Safe to say, people are really digging the food Marcus is putting in the past at Margie's Grill. Today, we're going to be talking about how he was inspired on all of his travels, working for Donald Link in his time at Herb Saint, and what it is like to go from pop-up to own owning your own business. Marcus, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So Margie started off as a pop-up. It was called Sparkle Horse Grill, right? <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. My business also started off as a pop-up. We moved it all around Brooklyn. And my personal experience with that was pop-ups, they allow your concept to get fine-tuned in front of people. The flip side is, is that you're fine-tuning your concept in front of people. It can be rough. Uh, yeah. Sometimes dishes can stumble out of the gate. Um, you're, you're workshopping on your future clientele. Talk a little bit about that the pop-up um that you did that led to your restaurant was there expectations based on where you previously worked uh how how did you find a space for the pop-up what did that look like yeah i mean we had a built-in clientele of our friends who worked with us in in the food industry in new orleans you know which was like good to have that like kind of guaranteed first round of business in there uh we started doing pop-ups at a bar that's pretty much right across the street from our house they had this big backyard uh, situation there, and we just put a couple kettle grills outside and and got started. And like stumbling out of the gate is uh, exactly what we did the first time around. It was like, you know, packed the house, didn't bring enough food, didn't anticipate how long it was going to take to cook things. We had a cornbread on the menu because I was like really thought having cornbread with our sauces would be this great thing to soak up. And woke up in the morning and realized that I didn't have any cornmeal at my house. And that, like, <laughs> I didn't want to make cornbread. Like, tried to get my neighbor to make it. And it ended up just, like, 
86 in it uh-huh. pretty much right off the bat there. Uh, and so when you, you bring all these friends in and you say, here's our pop-up, mm-hmm. it's going to serve X type of cuisine and we're going to do it for this type of uh, duration. Was it really like super slapdash where you were like, we're going to cook tonight and see how it goes? Or did you have sort of a flavor profile, an idea in your head that we're going to transition this pop-up into Margie's Grill down the line? Yeah, I mean, it started, like, the food that we cook at Margie's and that we did at the pop-up started with just the food that Caitlin and I cook at home, which is, you know, backyard barbecue, but seasoned with these flavors that we love, these Vietnamese and Thai flavors. There's this very large Vietnamese population in New Orleans, so people are kind of already familiar with those flavors. It's, like, built into the culinary language there a bit. Um, so we'd just been cooking for our friends at our house and eating this way and thought, you know, we're both restaurant people when we both are ambitious and eventually we want to have our own space. So, uh, we thought like, let's just start workshopping this. Let's get people in and see what they think, see if we can make it work as a service, you know, instead of just a dinner party. Um, and yeah, so we definitely had the intention to open a restaurant. Why, why was it called the Sparkle Horse Grill? Uh, well, uh, Caitlin, my partner, is uh, obsessed with... It. That might be a strong word. She's very into, uh, you know, like rainbows and unicorns and things. It's, we joke that, like, every time during the holidays, all our friends just get her, like, unicorn shit. The, our house <laughs> is just, like, full of, like, adult coloring books and glitter. <laughs> and we were writing a business plan. Um, with the intention of opening a restaurant and we just needed like a placeholder name, mm-hmm. you know? And so I was just like, all right, well, we'll just put Sparkle Horse in there for now. Um, and we didn't know that that was a band at the time either, which is like, uh, not associated with glitter and unicorns and things. <laughs> so we learned that after the fact, but yeah, that, that name came from that. And then when we started doing the pop-ups, we just kept the name around. And then later you transitioned it to name it after her mom, right? Exactly, yeah. Well, we knew that, we always knew the restaurant was not going to be called Sparkle Horse. <laughs> you're like, you know, had to grow out of that a little bit. And we didn't know what to call it. Uh, you know, we had the space and all that. We're just like trying to figure it out. You know, naming a restaurant's important and it's hard sometimes to think of the right thing. And Caitlin literally shot awake in the middle of the night and said, we're going to call it Margie's. We wanted it to to feel like a neighborhood restaurant, take away any like, pretension or anything like that you know margie's is casual sounding place you know just to hang out it feels like a place that could have been there for a hundred years that you maybe even just took over and bought and put put a new coat of paint on it it. exactly yeah uh so you grew up in ohio Mm -hmm. a midwest guy yep i'm from michigan oh I don't care about sports, <laughs> but I, I probably should, but I don't really. Uh, but I think we're supposed to hate each other, yeah. uh, each other. But but I I don't care. Um, <laughs> uh, but how was uh, growing up in the uh, in the shadow of the state of Michigan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna slide that in there. Uh, well, my father taught at Ohio State University. Aha, uh-huh. uh, the Ohio State University. So uh, we were uh, you grew up in Columbus. In Columbus, mm-hmm. yeah. So we were uh, indoctrinated pretty early. Yeah. And what's Columbus like? It's a it's for those that don't know that have never been to the Midwest. Pretty big city. It is. Yeah. It, it it's big, you know, it's the capital of Ohio. It's uh pretty dominated by the college. Mm-hmm. You know, the university, especially in recent years, has like spread to almost the entire downtown area with the, you know, off-campus housing and things catering to students and things like that. It's a gigantic school. I mean, yes. It's, yeah. And so your father taught there? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. was your mother, anyone else in the family, affiliated with the university at all? Uh, not professionally, but, mm-hmm. I mean, like, we were there all the time. <laughs> you know, Hard to escape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so... You're growing up in Columbus. Uh, you're you're a teenager there. Are you are you into food already? You started cooking at a really young age. You you were already in the kitchen, sort of like in high school age, right? Yeah. Um, my family was like obsessed with food. You know, everything was food centered. We're a Jewish family. We'd have these big like cold cut spreads, and holidays were always like a time where everyone's in the kitchen cooking. We had a garden in the back of our house. We grew a lot of produce that we would you know, cook. Um, so it was always like a food centric household. I did not, uh, have a very good school career. I, uh, did seventh grade twice and then crapped out in ninth grade. Uh, and it was always the position of, of our family that like, if you're not in school, you're working, 
you know, and that included summer jobs and all that stuff. So when I was 14, which was the legal working age in Ohio, uh, my dad took me to the uh, sandwich shop near our house that we would go to all the time and said, like, give this kid something to do, basically. Uh, so I started there, uh, you know, cleaning fryers and changing soda fountain bags and all the glorious things that come with working in a all the super fun <laughs> all the super fun tasks uh -huh, being told uh, to mop the floor properly all they're that. like thank god we got this 14 year old teach him how to clean the fryer <laughs> his dad's not gonna let him quit so yep. we can give him all the crap jobs yeah uh so with your dad as someone who works in a university and then school not really working out for you did you did you feel like um you're really searching for your place or was it just like, I need money and my parents need me to get a job? Or did you feel like, Hmm, maybe uh, food is a zone where I could be successful and feel comfortable in. It, it took a while to consider it as a real profession for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was partying a lot, you know, uh, doing all kinds of dumb shit and basically just like had jobs in food because I didn't have an education and it's where I could, I knew that like I can show up to this place, work, bust my ass, get paid. You know, I'm thankful that I was instilled with a good work ethic. So it just came naturally to me to be like, if I'm here, I'm gonna be working hard. And then, you know, I worked, you know, at a number of sandwich shops, pizza places, things like that, just collecting a paycheck, delivering pizzas, that kind of thing. And then, um, came by Elena's restaurant mm -hmm. um, and she actually catered my bar mitzvah years before that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, you know, that was a place that was a really special neighborhood restaurant. Um, she Was that Elena's food and wine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She, um, you know, is a great chef. She changed the menu every single day, shopped at the market when like local food wasn't really something people talked about in Columbus, Ohio. You know, nobody really cared or knew what that mean, but she was really at the forefront of that trend. And so I was walking by her restaurant one day on the way from some other crap job that I didn't care about. And she had a sign up that said, uh, dishwasher needed must be willing to wash dirty dishes. And which is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and I've have since actually, I've put that sign out front of my restaurant when I'm looking for dishwashers. But, uh, so I just walked in there and they needed a dishwasher that night. So I started there um, washing dishes and, you know, eventually, you know, doing a lot of prep. One of the pantry cooks didn't show up one day. So I started working on pantry, working on salads and then moved back to the hotline. And so the, the young Marcus Jacobs was a little bit of a partier, maybe <laughs> didn't really have a huge amount of direction yet, yeah. but like once you hit, um, this restaurant, are you still kind of like a cocky young guy? Are you a sponge? Like, what's the, like, does it, at a point, does something click and you say to yourself, like, I, I'm learning things here and I enjoy learning them? Or, I mean, that was always part of it. I don't think that even then I really had a direction or a purpose. Like, it was just, I was partying a lot and mm -hmm. I just liked the lifestyle. It was, you know, the job at Elena's was the first time that I saw this thing where I can learn something every single day. And that was really, interesting to me and really cool that like the because the menu changed every day and because elena is so knowledgeable and hands-on you know every day i'd walk out of there with a new skill and the cam camaraderie is great i mean you've got your built-in friends and yeah, party group exactly, and you exactly, get off yeah. at <laughs> you get off at midnight and then you go out and then you can just do it all the next day and it can you, it can be fun but you can also fall into a little bit of a, a routine mm -hmm. um and, and and i'm curious after a while you decided to go and travel correct and so you went to japan after columbus so i went i moved to um california okay after columbus my uh brother had a child my niece and uh, he was in Eureka, California, mm -hmm. which is, you know, all the way up north. And I went out there to kind of help him out and for a change of scenery and got another job cooking a, a pretty like high end boutique hotel, mm -hmm. B&B kind of thing. And was still dicking off and all that. Yeah. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to move to San Francisco um, and I took it because I just thought it'd be a great place to live. And I actually got off the wrong BART stop and was outside of, wandered around and ended up outside of Zuni Cafe. Mm -hmm. 
um, which is, you know, an institution. Famous. Yeah. yeah very well known. I didn't know anything about it. And uh, the one of the owners was standing outside of the restaurant, and he saw I had, like, my knife bag on me, and we got to talking, and he offered me a job, or he offered me a stage. And mm. I said, yeah, sure, this place as good as any, you know, I'll check it out. And uh, that was really, like, working at Zuni was where I was like, this is what I want to do, you know? And that, the atmosphere there, the level of cooking, the level of professionalism was, like, it made me think, oh, I can take this seriously, mm -hmm. you know, and then living in San Francisco as well, it just opened your eyes to so many different cultures and different food ways and stuff. It was really exciting. For and me. so many people in San Francisco are taking that very seriously. Yeah. To, this is the amount of people dwarfs the amount of people in Columbus. That, yeah, that no, are for taking sure. That seriously. I mean, like I'd been in Columbus and I'd been in Eureka and those are all, you know, big, small towns, basically, sure. you know, so it was just like, oh, this is a real thing. This is a real career path. And then from there, I went to Japan. And and so b quickly, yeah, before yeah, we yeah. go to Japan, at Zuni, um, what type of uh, work were you doing there? Were you on a hot station? Were you uh, – and what type of food is it? What were you cooking? Well, so I'll preface by this is like a story of what a cocky little turd I was at the time as I walked in there and asked for a sous chef job after they gave me a stage. And, they, and the uh, – uh, sous chef at the time, who is still a friend, and she owns a cafe in Oakland now. She said, well, you know, I'm a sous chef. I've been here for eight years, whatever. My husband's a sous chef. He's been here for eight years. So we can get there, but not right away. Right. And we'll basically, we'll just, like, sit down. Slow your, yeah. <laughs> slow your roll a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I started on the grill there, which is a big wood-fired grill. So Zuni's Food, um, Judy Rogers, who passed away a couple years ago, was the chef co-owner. Um of Zuni, she was like one of the early Chez Panisse acolytes. Um, so it was very in that same vein of Chez Panisse of California food, ingredient forward, um, but centered around these live fire cooking stations. So there was the front of the restaurant, um, we called it the spaceship. There's these two stations that were the wood burning grill and then this big, or wood burning oven and this big charcoal grill. And I worked the grill and I loved it. I mean, it was hot and intense and it was a busy station but you're like literally shoveling coals and cooking these big cuts of meat it was really cool as a young cook to get to do that and there's this like performance aspect of it too because you're basically in the dining room doing it you're on display you're giving them what they've come for yeah, yeah yeah and it was just the food coming out of zuni still is you know was and is delicious and consistent and like the best home cooking you would ever have you know i think judy called it like an homage to the grandmothers of the world basically mm -hmm. was kind of the, the ethos. And so you start to get serious there. Mm -hmm. You're really putting in some time. And then what's next after that? Japan? Yeah. So then I, you know, I, I loved my time in San Francisco, but realized that I couldn't actually afford to live there as a cook. Uh, and so I, you know, I wanted to change. I had some money saved up and I, had, I wanted to travel. I'd never been outside of the country before. And I kind of just, decided on Japan. I was at the time, you know, living in Chinatown in San Francisco, immersed in all these different Asian cuisines of the city, you know, particularly Japanese cuisine was really important to me at the time. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to go do this. So I got uh, involved with Woof, which is the Willing Workers on Organic Farms, like a farm exchange, mm -hmm. um, which is an awesome program. You basically just fly to a country and then these farmers or you know different agriculture business people put you up on their property in their house you work for them part-time and then you just are in this countryside the rest of the time so i stayed um on four farms throughout four months in japan um the first of which was on this little island in the sea of japan called nakanoshima which is like you know population a thousand and uh that place was a combination rice farm and uh like uh, i'm gonna pronounce it wrong but uh riori ryokan it's like a hotel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they would take like japanese people from the mainland would come stay with them we would go drop them off in the middle of the ocean on a rock and they would go fishing overnight you know with all this expensive fishing gear and then we'd bring them back clean them up prepare their fish for them and make this like nice dinner and they had a full scale farm as well um, and I went to several other farms around, stayed at a Spanish restaurant that did their own charcuterie run by a Japanese family. 
at, in the mountains in the middle of nowhere in Fukuoka Prefecture. So that, that time was really just like very eye-opening, a very cool experience to be, you know, in these extremely rural parts of an incredibly modern country and learning these all types of different traditional food ways and even some like more modern stuff as well. Yeah, that I, I spent a little bit of time in, in Japan as a teenager with my family and that what you just said struck me is that it's so the differences between the extreme of mm-hmm. modernity in the metropolis, the city centers, and then how quickly it gets rural. Yeah. And then how quickly you're like in the 14th century. <laughs> like totally. Things slow down. You like you get off the bullet train and then you walk three blocks and you're like, and I'm in a, I'm in a thousand years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean like I, this one place I stayed at, which uh, was the Spanish restaurant. Um, I get off and, you know, get off the train, take a bus, get off the bus and I'm at the base of a mountain. I'm like, all right, I guess I'm walking up the mountain. You know, I didn't have a smartphone or <laughs> yeah. Uber or none of that. Right. So I'm like, I think it's up here. I can't read the signs, but I started walking up and I get to the place and I walk in and it's this big like wood lodge that they had built up in the mountains. Everything's powered by wood fire and uh, no electricity. But I walk in and they have on like a, a some kind of laptop or something. They're playing Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting around this, it's like the restaurant had closed. A bunch of people sitting around, like smoking weed. And I walk. I'm like, is this the place? <laughs> and you know, it's this place. And and it was run by this young family, and they just like had this lovely mountain life. But they still would go down into town and go to like reggae shows. And that's awesome. Trip. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and so of all the adventures that you had over those four months, does. Does a specific style of Japanese cuisine jump out at you as something that you uh, connected with? Because uh, for the uninitiated or if you live in a smaller place in America, your experience with Japanese food is really just the California roll style Mm -hmm. sushi. That's not what Japanese food is actually truly about. There's Mm -hmm. so much more to it. it. Are there other pieces of it that that excited you and that you were able to interact with? Yeah, I mean, like. In the cities, like, you know, when I, I flew into Osaka and I stayed in Osaka for a couple of days, the yakitori immediately on the street, the grilled chicken skewers and all these little pieces were, I mean, Americans love grilled chicken. Right. And that was immediately the thing I was drawn to. Sure. Uh, and then just staying in these farmhouses and cooking just Japanese home food was awesome and, and revelatory in this way of, like, it is this simple home-cooked cuisine, but there's so much, like tradition behind the way that people do things a lot that you know like every day we would come home and we'd be like busting our ass outside all day come back and just the first thing we do was start a dashi for whatever we were making Mm -hmm. and it was just like really cool to see this kind of simplified home cooking but just well executed with great ingredients i mean if we wanted eggs you just go outside and grab them if you want vegetables you pull them out of the ground you know go up like in the mountains to get different herbs and to get like some fruits and things for breakfast or for dinner you know it was like that connection to the land was awesome to me to see we're going to take a quick break and when we come back more and also we're going to jump to new orleans stick with us here on the line next year heritage radio network is turning 10 For the last decade, we've been committed to bringing listeners around the world the very best in food radio, for free. Our small staff and incredible network of hosts work hard so that listeners can tune in each week to hear the important conversations in food policy, stay on the cutting edge of cocktail culture, and hear the latest updates in food tech. But there is no HRN without the support of listeners like you. Become a member of Heritage Radio Network today and help HRN get a strong start to our second decade. Choose from exclusive member gifts and stay in the loop on discounts to upcoming events. There's no better time to show your support. Go to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate and wish HRN a happy birthday. This program is brought to you by Jules Sous Vide. 
My name is Katie Mosman Wadler. I am the executive director of HRN and a real life Jewel user. When you cook with Jewel, there's zero guesswork. So steak, chicken, seafood, turkey, vegetables, and eggs all come out exactly the way you like them. The Parrot app is intuitive to use and preloaded with all the recipes you'll need, and it has a great visual doneness guide. Jewel is awesome for holiday cooking. It's easy to cook for a crowd, and it's perfectly precise, so you can focus on entertaining without worrying about checking food temps, while Jewel does all the work. You can try out new cuts fearlessly. One of the best things I ever made sous vide was a juicy, tender heritage goose with juniper berries, and it was life-changing. And pro tip, Jewel is small and packs easily, so you can sneak it along on your holiday travels to be this season's food hero everywhere you go. With Jewel, you get perfect food every time. To get yours, visit chefsteps.com slash Jewel and use code HRN, as in Heritage Radio Network, to get $15 off for a limited time. That's chefsteps.com slash J-O-U-L-E, code HRN. And happy holidays from all of us at Team HRN. Welcome back to The Line. If you're just joining us, my guest is Chef Marcus Jacobs. He's the co-owner of Margie's Grill in New Orleans. It's been written up in countless publications. It won several awards opening in 2017. And before the break, we were talking about his travels in Japan. And then you ended up coming back stateside. And did you go directly to New Orleans? I took kind of a roundabout way there. I was uh, staying in Texas with some friends. Um kind of figuring out you know maybe i'll move to austin maybe i'll go here you know uh and then it was the day of the saints nfc championship game in 2009 we took the train in to watch the game in new orleans from san antonio and i had some friends that had been living there and that was like the biggest party i've ever been to to this day i mean we won that football game and like i don't know if people like are aware of how much pride new orleanians have in the saints Mm -hmm. but like we knew we were going to Super Bowl. The whole city erupted into just parades everywhere. There's like cops dancing on the hood of their cars and shit. <laughs> like it was so much fun. I said, okay, well, I'm just going to stay here for a couple weeks or whatever, you know, and get some part time work. Um, and then that turned into a couple months. And then I just stuck around, I'm still there. And you ended up at Herb Saint? Yeah, yeah. I got, uh, well, I had walked into Koshan because I really wanted to learn about butchery. Because I think that that's like most young chefs and cooks are like at some point think that they want to be a butcher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really want to learn whole hog butchery, and they were doing that there. And I walked in, did a stage. They said, you know, we're not hiring now, but you can go work at Herbsane until something opens up here. And when I stayed at Herbsane, I just liked it there. I mean, it's like, you know, it's a small kitchen, a small crew, putting out like consistently excellent food. Um, The standard that they hold themselves to for food and for service at Herb Saint was just consistently high. And there was just this understanding of like, you don't put up bullshit. Like everything is done the right way, mm-hmm. you know? And that was really cool to work in a place where it was like, we're going to do this the best that we can with relatively limited resources as, as far as kitchen equipment, things like that go. Um, so I just stuck around there. And that's uh, so that's a Donald Link restaurant mm-hmm. and, and Donald Link, very decorated. The current CDC won a James Beard Award at that restaurant. Is that kitchen vibe? Is it a, a teaching kitchen? Is it a sink or swim type of t- type of kitchen? I mean, I was there for eight years, and it was all of those things at one point or mm-hmm. another. When I started there, Donald was still expediting most services or backing up the expo most services, um, and it was, I mean, to be frank, like intimidating at times because you know. You don't want to fuck up in front of this guy who's like this big deal chef, you know? Right. And, you know, he would let you know if you were. And, but, you know, it, it was this thing of everybody kind of pushing each other to do the best that we could, you know? And one instance of that is just with staff meal. Every day they switch off who makes staff meal. And it was this like one upsmanship amongst us to see, like, I'm going to make a badass staff meal today. Like, I'm going to make something really cool with no time. I love the idea of staff mill being a area to show off yeah. and stretch your legs a little bit. And also, when, at the end of the day, you are feeding your coworkers, so they're going to be pleased. If you put mm. up just a, you know, like a fast 
rice and beans and chicken. They're going to be happy because they want to eat. But, right, it's, right. but it's cool that uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of show everyone, like, here's my skills. Yeah, you know? for sure, for sure. And I think that that was like, that aspect alone was really cool when I had started there. It's like, this is your time to shine. If you want to say you want to get a dish on the menu, make it for staff meal. Give it know? a shot yeah, right now. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you spent eight years there. It's obviously very difficult to distill eight years down into, you know, we could probably talk about your eight years there for the entire time, but you're, you're growing as a, as a cook there and you're, you're rising up the ranks. You're getting promoted. What are some moments or some big takeaways from your eight years there that, still you lean back on as now that you've got your own spot that you say there was this one time when I was either going down or had a great day and now you use that as a as a tool or some piece of motivation for yourself or for someone that works for you yeah I mean like for better or worse Donald Link's voice is always in the back of my head Uh he's always standing like right next to me when Uh I'm cooking so there's this thing of like a common saying in the herb saying kitchen is you know would you serve that to your ex would you say that to your grandmother or your mom or your girlfriend whatever mm-hmm. and you know we'd certainly i think about that every time a plate goes up at margie's is like is that good enough for would you serve that to your mom mm-hmm. you know would you serve that to someone that you cared about because yeah. i care about all these people in dining room totally much, you know and you know as far as single instances go it's hard to just grab one uh but you know there was just constant running thread of like cook with heart be proud of what you're putting on a plate and stand behind everything that you cook and every knife cut that you do and every piece along the way, you know? When you and Caitlin decided to do your, uh, your pop-up and then transition it into a restaurant, uh, it was always existed as a casual spot, right? For sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about, you know, in our business plan, even and in the early days of us just talking about opening a restaurant, stripping down the dining experience, you mm-hmm. know, keeping the things that are important to us as far as food and service goes, which is quality of ingredients, uh, proper technique, and, and, you know, in the dining room, making sure everyone is attended to, not overly fussed over, you know, but then taking away things that aren't important to us. Like, I don't give a shit about tablecloths or like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, having the right silverware or like you know which is in quotation marks like uh (laughs) you know like we have all of our glassware and silverware and plates are all thrifted and mismatched and they're cool and funky and it's like you know we don't ever want to be a place that you would feel like uh anxiety over going to or feel like you had to put on a show for you know we want to be a casual neighborhood place good food on a plate yeah not too fussy uh is that what you think is working right now in the food scene in New Orleans, or do you not really care? Or is it, do you think that it's you are part of or the start of a larger trend that's happening, not only in New Orleans, but maybe in other cities as well? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, like as a whole, people are tending towards casual dining more, you know, but they still want good food. You know, people want the food to be. Um, excuse me, to be prepared properly and with good ingredients, you expect that. But more and more people are caring less about the accoutrement of fine dining, mm-hmm. you know. And I think New Orleans has a lot of really cool, casual restaurants opening up right now. There's this, like, third wave of chefs, people who have come up through the kitchens of the people who came up through the, you know, stalwart old-school New Orleans restaurants. Mm-hmm. And now you have all these... People who were, you know, myself included, sous chefs or chefs de cuisines in these fine dining restaurants three, four years ago are kind of striking out on their own with their own visions and their own take on food. Uh, And it's all casual and it's all, you know, kind of a come as you are thing, which New Orleans is a come as you are kind of town anyway, you know. (laughs) I read that you uh, bought the building that Margie's is in. Uh, a lot of chefs, that's kind of the dream. They That helps you control your own destiny more than having a lease. I'm curious about, you've referenced your business plan a couple times now. I'm wondering, uh, was that part of the original business plan or did you find a building and then you thought, well, this is too good to pass up and also... Uh, we're recording in Brooklyn right now. We're in New York City. That's not something that is usually a viable option here. Um, I don't know the New Orleans real estate market 
is that a surprising thing in New Orleans or is that the type of thing that people are more and more starting to do that in order to control their own destiny? I, we're outside of the norm on that of owning the building, but it was important to us from day one. We we weren't going to go into a place that we couldn't buy the building. Mm-hmm. That was kind of like we're going to bide our time until we find the right place. Um, certainly, real estate is considerably cheaper in New Orleans than it is here. Um, but, you know, it was just important to us. We didn't have a lot of money, and we didn't want to um, – we didn't really want to make any compromises on what we were going to do. You know, so we found this building. It had been sitting empty for a long time, but still had a stove, a fryer, commercial refrigerators, prep tables. It was literally set for service from like nine years ago (laughs) uh, down to there was silverware rolled up on the table. Wow. And salt and pepper shakers and stuff. So we... Somebody just closed overnight or something? Yeah. Or, I mean, it could have been a front or something. The refrigerators (laughs) were like a little bit too clean for it to ever have actually been a restaurant, I think. But uh, it was, uh, you know, really just the right place. It had all the things we wanted. It had an outdoor space. And so we jumped on it. And so you put together this business plan. Are you shopping it around to folks in New Orleans and saying, let me let me do a private tasting for you? Are you just walking around the backyard when you're doing Sparkle Horse and saying, we're doing a restaurant. Does anybody want to talk further about this? Like, how do you pitch people on this grand idea of let me do this restaurant our way Mm -hmm. and oh by the way we're gonna buy a building as well and do that well initially yeah we shopped it around to a couple people um you know i was reasonably well connected uh new orleans is a small town and the restaurant community is small um so there was people that we went to to ask for a loan ask for this we couldn't get any money from anybody nobody wanted to nobody gave a shit about us opening on broad street uh, so, uh, we just did it ourselves. We were, we went all in. We, uh, I got, uh, you know, some money from my grandma and Caitlin got money from her grandma and we, uh, just opened with, you know, pretty much nothing. And, uh, how, how scary did that feel? Uh, it was very intense. I mean, it, we had this dream and this passion. We did everything by hand in the restaurant, you know, Caitlin reupholstered every single one of the chairs that we have because she had this dream of wanting glitter vinyl on the chairs, Mm -hmm. which you couldn't find anywhere. When you're shopping for like restaurant stuff, everyone's got the same shit and it's it's all expensive and it's all cheaply made. So we're like, all right, we'll buy, you know, 200 yards of glitter vinyl and a staple, borrow a staple gun. And she, in the dining room of the restaurant, stapled every single chair and I put them all back together. Um, so it, it was an intense process of like, we're building this. I hope people come. Mm-hmm. And honestly, the first four months were slow, like terrifying. It, we got it down to where it would just be me, Caitlin, and a dishwasher. And, wow. you know, we do a lot of live fire cooking. We have charcoal grills inside the restaurant. I would wait until somebody walked in the door and I'd get the chimney on the stove and start lighting charcoal on it. What what do you think was the turning point between those first couple months when things were a little slow to when you got to a point where you were able to hire another person and uh, and bodies were coming in and you were filling the seats more? Um, I mean, one of the biggest things was we got written up in the New York Times. Mm-hmm. And um, that was the week before Jazz Fest, which is a big deal in New Orleans. A lot of, a lot of people come into the city. Uh, it's like kind of our busiest time of the year. A lot of people from New York and the area around here as well. Um, And that was great timing. That kind of got us launched a little bit. And then just getting people used to coming to where we are. We're in kind of a non-traditional dining neighborhood. You know, I was walking around here today before we came in. And I was like, this reminds me a lot of like where Margie's is. Mm -hmm. Kind of like no man's land a little bit. Yeah, we're in a very industrial part of Brooklyn where it's like, warehouses with no doors and no signs right 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 i mean like we're like right down the street from the jail and there's like bail bondsmen's and jazz auto glass right next door to us Uh and you know i think that we just assumed people would want to come in and eat our food from the get-go and that really wasn't the case nobody knew who we were nobody cared you know but eventually when people did start coming in it became this like domino effect people would bring their friends and then their friends would come in and they'd bring their friends and we have really become popular in the service industry realm of New Orleans. You know, we have chefs and bartenders and waiters that come in and recommend us all the time. 
I love how spices can carry over from various types of cuisines and how uh, really disparate restaurants and flavor profiles can be tied together by various uh, spices. So, for example, I looked over your menu and, well, your restaurant, my restaurant are not very close at all. You've got turmeric all over the menu and I've got turmeric mm-hmm. all over the menu. And however you want to describe your restaurant, I'll describe mine as a Mediterranean restaurant. Mm-hmm. But uh, we've got turmeric cauliflower and uh, we've got chicken marinade, which has a lot of turmeric in it. And you've got uh, it on cracklins, oysters, pork shoulder. So you've been to Japan, Southeast Asia. You've worked in French cuisine. I guess my, my question here is I want to know about your favorite spices. If you can just mm-hmm. tell me a couple that really have spoken to you over all your travels and how you make your food come together when you can pull from anywhere uh, how do you figure it out? I mean, heat, like chili heat, is something that is like I'm addicted to it. I can't eat food without hot sauce or chili flake or something on it, you know. And then within the realm of that, like specific chili flavors have become something I crave and that I always try to work into our food. Like we have some habanero plants out back at the restaurant that we pick off of regularly, and that habanero specific flavor that like fruity chili thing is something that i crave in my food and that i always try to work into places uh similarly like lemongrass you know eating in thailand you have these like intense spicy dishes and then you get these pops of this like bright grassy herbal lemongrass in there and it just kind of balances everything out and that's something that we work into a lot of dishes as well Tell me about your travels a little bit. You you went to Southeast Asia. There's so much. There's funk. There's sweet. There's salty. There's heat in the exact same bite of a dish. You're, I feel like a lot of times in 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 that realm, you're like, what is in here? You just you're desperate to kind of find out like how did they make this thing taste funky, sweet, salty, all at the same time. So t- tell us a little bit about your travels and. Uh, and what that food did to you when you were when you were over there? Yeah, I mean, when we decided like we're going to be serious about opening this restaurant. So if we're cooking food that's inspired by Thai food and Vietnamese food, then we need to go to the source and actually kind of wrap our heads around the real deal a little bit. Um, and you know, street food culture in Vietnam and in Thailand is so huge; it's everywhere. And you are eating these dishes, like you're saying, that are so complex. You're just like, how do they do this? So we would just go to these stalls, and I'd sit there for half an hour, an hour, whatever, and just watch people cook. And then like try to talk to people. And you know, a lot of times, to get the good stuff or the off cuts or whatever, I'd have to like stand next to somebody that was preparing the food and be like, no, it's okay. You can put the beef bile in my soup. Like, I'm not going to send it back. Or like, you can put the chili in there. I'm not scared, you know? Um, so definitely like seeing the food preparation firsthand like you do on the streets out there is hugely important for us. You know, I'll, I'll go back and look at pictures I've taken or look at videos to be like, oh yeah, that's how they, you pound the garlic with the chili first and then you mix the fish sauce into it, you know? And when you, when you were over there, did you think, uh, this is going to work well with product, produce, proteins that I have at my fingertips in New Orleans, like did, was it a, was it prior to traveling over there that you were already playing around with those flavors at home and you said this is working really well? We should fly over there. Or was it backwards? Did you go there on vacation and then say like this is really coming together in my head? Well, I mean, we knew before we went that the climates are very similar, the um, produce similar, and the way that people eat is very on par with the way people eat in the South. I mean, like. You go into a gas station in Louisiana, in rural Louisiana, and you'll have organ meat and boudin sausage. You'll have fresh crackling. It's basically like a butcher's counter in a gas station. You know, people are unafraid of food in Louisiana in a very similar way that they are in Thailand and Vietnam. Um, You see the use of pork as a staple ingredient the same way, you know, like a seasoning agent more than just the main dish, you know. You definitely see knuckles and feet in in the south used in a very normal way Mm -hmm. where you know in michigan there aren't as many places that people eat you know right pig's knuckles and things like that right um and so when you're when you're down there and you're 
sorry, when you're over there and, and you're, you're, you're backpacking around or you're traveling around to all these places, um, do you have a little notebook with you and are you writing up dishes for Margie's at that time? Are you, are you building out the restaurant at that time? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, we had like kind of a repertoire of dishes from doing the pop-ups that mm-hmm. we were already doing. It's also really important to me that we are cooking whatever the best product we can get our hands on. So the menu is always changing, but like, yeah, I definitely had a notebook and we were drawing pictures of what the lunch plates would look like, you know, mm-hmm. trying to really like, conceptualize that we took a boat from uh on the mekong all the way through laos and the entire time we're just scribbling on a notebook of menu ideas what the signs are going to look like how these are actually going to come together how service is going to work you know has anyone ever said to you in in new orleans or otherwise when in your travels like hey you're a white guy from ohio like this isn't your food or hey why are you cooking this food? Like, has that, have you come up against um, the discussion of cultural appropriation? And I'm curious how you react to it and what your thoughts on it are, since uh, that's something that a lot of chefs uh, are talking about openly sure. now, working with flavors that are potentially, like, not the flavors of your childhood, perhaps. Mm-hmm. I mean, to that, I'd say, like, it's not something that has people have like come to me offended about, you know, Mm -hmm. we, we are respectful with this cuisine. Uh, but you know, I'm also, I'm not French and I'm not Italian and I'm not Spanish. And that's what most American cooks are taught. Totally. These things, Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't really want to cook the steamed asparagus that I grew up on in a restaurant. You know, I'm cooking the food that I like to cook. Right. And we always try to approach everything with respect and we're not, a Thai restaurant. We're not a Vietnamese restaurant. If anything, we're a Southern restaurant and I'm not even from Louisiana, you know? So, uh, you know, as I, I feel like as long as we don't caricature, you know, and we just do our thing, I, everything is appropriation on some level. I mean, like I just, this is the food I like to cook and this is the way I like to cook it. You said that when you opened, you kind of had to strip your staff down to just you, Caitlin, and a dishwasher. Obviously, you've gotten busier. People mm-hmm. are now coming in. You now have some staff. Right. Uh, you had a long, long uh, cooking career prior where you rose up the ranks and you had a lot of people that you were in charge of. But now this is your own restaurant. You and Caitlin run the show. I'm curious about how you have two things. One, how have you de- redefined, if you have, your leadership style? since it is your own restaurant and also how have you balanced both co-owning a restaurant with being the chef of that restaurant yeah i mean i've definitely chilled out a lot in my leadership style i think my management style particularly you know when cooking and fine dining there's a lot of pressure and it's so easy to get bogged down and to be rude or aggressive or uh you know, wound up too tight. And I was doing that even at the outset of Marty's. You get so bogged down with everything and there's all this pressure that you can be, you lash out at people and you're overly critical and overly harsh, you know? And I realized that as the guy at the top of the food chain, like there's the buck stops here, there's nobody that I can pass anything onto, like any blame onto or anything like that. Like it's on me to create the culture that I want in my restaurant. So what that means for me is to be patient and to be uh, supportive of people and not an asshole, basically. I mean, I don't know if that makes enough sense, but, like, it's this, like, chef as a shouty asshole thing is kind of on the way out, I think. And I know that I want my staff to want to come to work. And what that means is that I need to make an environment in which they're comfortable and in which they want to be. You had a really great 2017 and 2018 you're, you're carrying in. Uh, what's your 2019 look like? Are you feeling in a place where maybe you're going to like be able to take a, a certain step back and do something that you haven't been able to do for two years? Are you like doubling down and digging back in? I'm, I'm curious, like since we're almost into 2019, Do you have plans for the restaurant and what might happen uh, going into what is basically your third year? Yeah. um, You know, the restaurant's open right now, which me being sitting here 
thousand miles away and having service going, that's something that a year ago would have seemed impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so getting the restaurant to where it can run itself, I have an excellent team. I have an excellent chef de cuisine who cares about the restaurant and she's there right now busting her ass on the line. Um, so getting it to where Margie's runs Margie's, Caitlin and I could step back a little bit um, and we're looking at opening a bar within the next year in New Orleans um, that would focus, you know, on, it would be a bar first, you know, focus more on drinks, on interesting cocktails, natural wines, good beer, and have some of the kind of like Vietnamese and Thai drinking food that we like so much, this like spicy, funky, small plate kind of stuff. Uh, so that's our next big project. Sounds awesome. Sounds exciting. I'm glad that you've gotten a little bit of time to get away from the restaurant. Uh, when people come down to New Orleans, tell them how they can find you. Where is the restaurant located and what are your hours of operation? Sure. So we're in Mid-City. We're on Broad Street. Um, Mid-City is the largest uh, neighborhood in New Orleans. So we're like right there in the middle of it. Um, we do lunch and dinner Monday through Friday, dinner only on Saturday. We open at 11 uh, for lunch. And then we open, uh, we close at 2.30 for that and then open again at 4 uh, for dinner. Um, if you take the Canal Street car line, we're a couple blocks off of that. Or if you get arrested, we're right up the street from the jail. So that would be <laughs> the quickest way to get to Margie's. Everybody go see them next time you're down in New Orleans at Margie's Grill. Thanks for being here. Appreciate you having on, coming on the show. Thank you very much. Nice. Join us every week Tuesdays at 11 a.m. for episodes of The Line here on Heritage Radio. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey, are you hungry? Well, you're in luck. Meet and Three is back for season 16. I'm Taylor Early, and we've got a whole new batch of reporters I am so excited to introduce you to. Hi, Hi there. I'm Elizabeth Fisher. Asha McElroy. Sam Girardi. Jessica Gingrich. Hannah from Wisconsin. I'm a swing dancing audio engineer. I am a future registered dietitian nutritionist. I'm from New York and I love rice and beans. My favorite food of all time is a shrimp burrito. I love watermelon. We've also got a bonus podcast for you called Behind the Internship. Three of our reporters will take you along to show how they develop stories for this very show, Meet and Three. Hi, I'm Danielle Flitter, a plant-based chef from Philadelphia, living in Mexico City. I'm Sophia Hooper. I'm a bartender based in Portland, Maine. My name is Addison Austin Liu. I am a chef and food journalist from Salt Lake City, Utah, and my favorite food is Peruvian. Rice and beans. Hand-drawn noodle soup. So tune in to enjoy a square meal for your ears. And I hope you saved a little room for dessert.